Awesome. Hey, folks. So we are currently live on Facebook, on the Bronx River Alliance Facebook page. I'm here with Journey Bimwala and Sadea Brownlee. Um, we are acknowledging our elders today. Um, my name is Nathan Hunter. I'm with the Bronx River Alliance. I'm with New York City Parks. I'm going to hand it over to my co-host today, Journey Bimwala, to introduce herself. Hey guys, I am Jeremy Bimwala. I am a co-chair of the Foodway. I am part of Concrete Plan Park, Friends with Concrete Plan Park. I'm also an herbalist, so um, welcome. You know, we love having you guys every week. So I just can't wait for you guys to hear um, what we have for you guys today. You guys are going to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> so Dea, you know, we are so amped to have you here today with us. Um, would you mind doing us a favor and just introducing yourself? Yeah, I am so happy to be here. Y'all are two of my favorite people doing mm -hmm. some phenomenal work. Uh, my name is Sadea Brownlee, and I am the manager of community organizing and special initiatives at Dream Yard. I am a sister, a daughter, um, a farmer without land right now. Um, an educator and former BQLT board president. If you don't know BQLT, it's Brooklyn Queens Land Trust. Um, and they're also doing some really important work around uh, land stewardship and sustainability and making sure that community members um, have the ability to self-determine um, on open space. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Uh, I'm also a transplant to New York. I've lived in Brooklyn for nine years. Um, I originally came from Greensboro, but I was born and raised in Detroit and South Carolina, um, where my family hails from. So super excited to be with y'all today. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, let's just roll into things. You know, we're excited to each week highlight a plant kin, um, a plant, you know, we have an affinity with, um, and would love for you just to introduce who you're bringing to the table today. <laughs> So when I told my sister I was doing this, she started cracking up because she was like, that's all you talk about these days. So I'm super excited to keep talking about one of my favorite plants. Um, its name is Life Everlasting. It is a gorgeous uh, one to two feet tall, um, dark green leaves, silvery leaves on the bottom, uh, yellow flower. Um, it's super strong. It's very vibrant when you see it, and it's just really beautiful. Um, I think the picture that we have here maybe is like a young a baby life everlasting. Um, but she grows in fields, um, doesn't really require a whole lot of caring for. Uh, most people forage for life everlasting versus like growing it straight from seed. Um, but I would be interested in trying that out. And Nathan, are we going to pronounce the botanical names together let's do it so one of these you know one of the aspects we love about holding space is just acknowledging that like sometimes some of these latin names can be a little scary so we want to just acknowledge their botanical name as it helps us kind of understand which plant we're actually trying to connect with since there's so many plants so our first one here, so we have two different plants we're highlighting here just to acknowledge differences, right? So we have Life Everlasting, which is Napoleon, um, obtusa, obtusa folium. So <laughs> and this is this is your, your classic Life Everlasting that it's been associated with, 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 it's the plant that you have an affinity specifically with. And then through our research and prepping for today, we were learning that there's actually, uh, you know, cousins of this plant, siblings. Um, and so Nephilium polycephalum. There we go. That's why we've got pronunciation here. <laughs> and, and this, yes, sorry. No, you're great. You're great. We're just, I just want to acknowledge that this is part of the Aster family, which is one of our biggest plant families out there. So we, we know you, we see you at Life Everlasting. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad you put the family group too, because um, one of the things that I like to do is kind of look and see what are the commonalities between parts of the plant with other members of the family. 
Um, and when you look, I'll show you guys in a minute what the flower heads look like. They look a lot like other members of the Astor family, like daisies, um, other little flowers with, with uh, like very 365s, perfect circles. Um, the clusters look very much like they would be in the Astor family, just like they're, they're family members. Um, so yeah, uh, Life Everlasting is very popular in the Southeastern United States. And my family and the community that we come from, which are the Gullah Geechee, um, it's a community of, of African-Americans that you can find um, throughout from North Carolina all the way down to Florida, um, where our culture is concentrated, has been designated as a part of a corridor. Um, the Gullah Geechee Corridor runs from Wilmington, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida, and 30 miles inland. Um, and then from a cultural standpoint, in terms of preservation, um, a lot of who we are and our food ways and our ways of being and philosophy and agricultural practices, all of those things um, are really uh, kind of like concentrated on the sea islands of South Carolina and Georgia, which are a cluster of over a hundred islands off of the coast of those two states. And so Life Everlasting grows, um, like I said, in the Southeastern US, but is um, a really big part of wellness and spiritual work in the Gullah Geechee community. Um, as well as the indigenous communities of that region. Um, so the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Natchez, um, the whole like Mississippian civilization um, also used life everlasting. They had a different name for it. I think it was um, some sort of tobacco. I'm forgetting the qualifier word, but they classified it as a tobacco and smoked it. Um, yeah, so should we get into like uses? Yeah, exactly. I appreciate kind of this overview and also just uh, the intention you bring to just acknowledging where your people come from. I think that's part of this work is, is acknowledging, you know, like how these how these plants uh, travel with us as, as humans, right, and associate with our cultures. Um, but yeah, I think like the big question is like, how did you first meet this plant? And <laughs> what was that moment like for you? So, you know, I don't recall my parents talking about life everlasting. My father has a relationship with this plant. Um, my great grandmother used to make tinctures and teas from this plant for him um, for colds uh, as, as a preventative measure and also if he, were, if he was sick. Um, I don't know that my mother's side of the family has a relationship with this plant, but my dad does. I didn't know any of that though until probably. 2016 or 2017 when I decided that I wanted to start making my own medicine. Um, I've always been a huge uh, uh, proponent of herbal medicine, um, always bought other folks tinctures, um, treated myself with teas, salves, um, poultices, but I never really like dedicated time to making my own. Um, and I specifically, especially because uh, herbs like white sage, uh, which are so special to very specific indigenous groups, but are overly used to the point that the plant is, is almost endangered and it's very difficult for the communities that specifically use that herb to, to access it. Um, that was one of the reasons that I, I, I wanted to reconnect with plants that were indigenous to my family and community, um, things that were had been with us for generations um, and that we typically go to like more popular wider uh, plants that have a wider use, like a, an echinacea and elderberry. While those are also really special to us too, um, I thought, well, let me reconnect with other plants that um, are equally powerful. And so that is how I came upon Life Everlasting. Um, I, in undergrad, when I was at Howard, I did my uh, undergraduate thesis on Gullah Geechee relationships. And so when you're you know, researching relationships between people, um, you're automatically gonna find things that sustain those people. And so in my time um, doing that work, I did begin to learn a lot more just um, about cultural practices within our community. Life Everlasting had come up in college and then something, I can't remember what was the specific impetus, but something um, in that period between 2016 and 2017, connected me back to the plant. 
Um, and from that moment, I was like, okay, let me figure out where I'm going to find it. Um, the first person that I asked was Karen Rose at Sacred Vibes Apothecary. Um, we were working together at um, a farm in Brooklyn. And I asked her if she was selling Life Everlasting, if she had access to some, she did. Um, and that first time she was like, no, you just need to have the plant. And she gave it to me. She just said, take this Life Everlasting um, and do with it what you're called to do. And so in the early days, I was just making teas with it. So I took my tea ball and I would sleep it for 15, 20 minutes in some hot water and just, you know, drink it with honey. Um, and I did notice that it like, overall, I, I felt weeks later, like I was prepared, kind of inoculated against any cold that might've been coming. Um, and then as I began to learn more about it, and its usages, um, I thought, let me try drinking this at certain times of the month. Um, and so in one of my favorite books, Voodoo Medicine, which is by a woman named Faith Mitchell, and it is it details Gullah herbal remedies. She says that there is a historical use of life everlasting for cramps, um, for menstrual cramps. And so I was like, mm, let me try, let me see what that does. And it really does help. It, it helped with my cramps. It just also elongated the whole process of the cycle. So I was like, okay, maybe we're not gonna take it <laughs> right before because I'm not interested in dragging that whole thing out. Um, but it did help with cramps. And, and um, I did notice though, I was like, I wanna try it in a tincture form because tinctures, once the dried plant um, that they call the menstruum, is steeping in an alcohol, then you have the power of the plant um, really stretched out for a longer time. It's just so much easier to absorb it in your body. Um, so I started making tinctures with it in 2018, but got a little bit more uh, disciplined with documenting um, how I was making the tincture when and its impact on me in 2019. So. Um, the tincture, I have noticed a huge impact on um, my body's ability to withstand colds. And if I am sick, to stave it off a lot faster. Um, and now I'm a little fancy and I like to blend other things with my tinctures. Hey. My life is black. <laughs> <laughs> you got a little formulating thing going on there. I like that. Ooh, I've been practicing my formulas. I, I would not call myself an herbalist because I think that to be an herbalist, you really, you really got to know formulas. You know, like I, I don't feel comfortable saying I'm going to sell a life everlasting tincture. I feel comfortable giving this to my family though, um, which I did do last month. And I think that it definitely kept us well as we were together during the pandemic from different parts of the country. Um, so I have two here with me also. But you see, I just want to piggyback on what you say. You don't feel you, you don't feel comfortable calling yourself an herbalist, and like, I, which I know you already know, there are many different types of herbalists, right? You have family herbalists where they don't treat anybody else, right? But their 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 immediate family, you know, themselves, their children, and immediate family. If you know herbs, how to use them, which you do. <laughs> You know how to make the, all of the different types of infusion with the water, which you do. You've been making tinctures. You know, you have the, the vocabulary words for it. You spend time with the herbs. You have all of this intricacy. You know, you are an herbalist. You know, you just might be a home herbalist or, uh, you know, herbalist to, to those who are close to you, but you're still treating, you know, you, you are seeing people and helping them with things. So you should definitely call yourself that. Um, because it's 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 in our roots, it's in your roots, it's in your blood, you know, it's been transferred to you by what you saw your parents, but because you, you see your father you even talk to you about it, right? So hearing it, you've experienced it, you know, you know you come from a long family of that. So on behalf of this uh black history month, you are. <laughs> on it <laughs> thank you journey i appreciate that i do appreciate that sometimes i think you know we need a little bit more support just kind of stepping into that those those titles that feel so big 
Um, and I think we're so used to associating those titles with having a specific amount of knowledge. So I appreciate you just challenging me to step into that. Yes, only <laughs> step into it. That's what you are. You know, you're an herbalist and that's, that, that's the title. And I really want you to lean on that because like, especially, you know, from, from, from our beginnings in this land and many other lands, you know, our uh, healing, right? Our healers, our herbalists from the time, regular medical professional doctor will go to the healers to get their medication, to get, mm -hmm. to get better, you know? And then years later on, we were prohibited of using it. We were uh, felt made to feel like we didn't know what we was talking about, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, we have, to rec we have to claim that. We have to reclaim what was forbidden for our ancestors to even just pass it down to us. You know what I mean? And you've got it and you're passing it down by sharing it with everybody else, you know? So you got stand on it, sis, stand on it. <laughs> and that's, that's such an important word too, because um, the Gullah community is, you know, we have lost so much land over, you know, a period of like 150 years, right? We know that waterfront property is highly valued um, within the capitalist culture that we live in. Um, we primarily live on waterfront property. Um, so the Ligichi people are wayfarers, they're fisher, fisher folks, they're crabbers, they're shrimpers, mm -hmm. um, people that have a really intimate relationship with the earth. Um, and really, before we migrated to cities, operate, operated within a closed loop system, meaning like everything that we consumed, um, everything that we produced and consumed was a part, was a part of an ecosystem that supported each other. Um, and it wasn't wasteful, you know, like yeah. everything that was harvested, everything that was killed was used for completely down to the last, like piece of fat or root or whatever it is, you know, every single part. Um, and it's, it's so important um, that we are standing in that truth because it allows us to um, feel confident in who we are, but also have the tools that we need to sustain ourselves in spite of, you know, whatever is going on in the world, in spite of racism, colonialism, imperialism, being able to stand strong in the things that withstood our ancestors in the midst of the craziest, the, the most, you know, harmful, torturous things. Um, so I really, I appreciate you saying that. Um, and it just, it also reminds me that like, there are so many people um, who are doing this work. Um, I'm really glad that Nathan put Ichi Experience up here. Um, they're based in North Charleston. But one of the reasons that I love the work that they do is that they acknowledge that the Gullah Geechee diaspora it extends beyond the Southeastern United States, you know? Mm -hmm. Just because I can't speak Gullah or Geechee um, or because I was born in Detroit doesn't make me any less Gullah, you know? My dad is from South Carolina. My dad is from the Low Country. Um, and that same, you know, that same knowledge, it runs in our blood um, and it, it's, it, it, you can't, you just can't deny it, you know? And when I make tinctures, I like to make sure that I, I intentionally call on my ancestors, specifically my great grandmother, who I knew worked with this plant um, and ask her to support me in the making of the formula, you know, like, let me know when to stop with how many, how much of the flour I'm putting in. Let me know when to stop with the whiskey um, and any other ingredients that I use. Um, so I'm, I, I think that, you know, if we are going to, if we're not going to just survive, but if we're going to really enjoy our lives, we're going to have to call on practices that were sustainable and equitable, not just to humans, but also to the earth that sustained the soil that we, we use and the air that we're breathing. I agree. I totally agree with what, with, with what you're saying. It's funny. Earlier today, I was watching um, some herbalists, um, much, el you know, one of our elderly from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And just what you said, you know, she was like, you know, they, 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 they will call on the ancestors to help them 
um, figure out, right, like what herbs to use, is this enough and all the other things. So, and, you know, she just kept saying like, you know, you guys have to keep the tradition going, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's everybody else's stuff is good, but like there is nothing wrong with what we have, keep it going. So hearing you, and then, you know, you, you, you're doing the exact same thing that she's doing and she's all the way in South Africa, that, that right there is, it's amazing. It's, 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 it's beautiful. And we have to claim that because when we did do it, when we were all immersed in it, in it, our health was entirely different. It was not in the same state as it is now. Our health mm -hmm. started to get worse over the time when we were no longer able, allowed to participate or even share the information with just even with just our children, right? Like mm -hmm. it became a lot harder and everything changed from there. And if there was nothing wrong with it, then why not practice it? Why not, why not do it? And it's not to take away from any other forms of, of herbalism that are there, but in honor of like history month, you can't just have Western herbalism, um, Eastern Western uh, herbalism, uh, uh, Chinese, um herbalism and then i'm always like well what about what about us mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what about us and it was always as if well because you guys didn't have things written or because you know this thing wasn't put together we can't really use that bs i call that bs because you will learn from it you mm -hmm. know and our way of going through the process has its own place and has its its own crown and merit. There's a reason why things were passed down through words and not necessarily written down. People don't mm -hmm. really dig deep in that because it requires you as the person learning to be fully immersed, to be fully in it because you not you really have to remember all of this stuff. You have to find a way to make it part of you. When you can read, when you can see, it's great, but you don't have to use everything to remember because you can be like, you know what, I can always go back and read it again, you know? Exactly. And with us, it's like, no, you have to know these things mm -hmm. because once I pass it down to you, whoever you choose to pass it down, like there's all of this different intricacy that we overlook because of the Western way of doing things. And then we'd be like, well, they didn't write it. Maybe, you know, they just they didn't know enough, but they didn't know whatever. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Conversation too, just around like how you know what you know, like epistemology and the way that we codify knowledge. Yeah, that's, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up. It just, it really makes me think about um, one of my favorite scholars, Dr. Um, Dr. K. Bunseki Fukiao, you know, and him talking about plants being these pipelines to the nutritive and curative substances of the earth. And so to be a farmer, from what, from what he talks about in Old Congo, you have to know the earth, you have to know the plants. It is an honor that you don't just get to select to do, you have to get fully immersed and acquainted with the earth before it reveals its secrets to you. Yes. Um, and I just really appreciate that, like, as you said it, like this, this relationship, um, it takes time and being able to just be completely in it. That's how you learn, you know, it's, it's, I love taking notes too, but I also need to be like squarely in the thing, doing uh -huh. it, feeling it. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, our people do have their own special way of getting you to learn certain things. And it's not one week, two weeks, some it it's years, mm -hmm. you know, because there's so many layers that you have to get into. Like you said, you know, the, 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 you have to get to the soil. When I started with herbs, I've always loved herbs as a child, mm -hmm. but I've known them on the dry end. Okay, what you buy at the store, what you see on the thing. I've never knew an the, the herbs that I, that I know what it does, I never seen it in its real life form. I never seen it in yeah. its own environment. And that was the piece that was missing. It's like, but you don't know what the herb like, you don't know its condition. You don't know 
all of this other stuff that adds on to the medicine, that adds on to the healing. And then when you do find it, you know, connecting with it, like you said, the soil, you know, the soil with the microbes in there that feeds the plant, like you got to connect with all of this intricate living parts mm -hmm. of the ecosystem and exchange that energy. So you also have to be able to, to understand the messages that come through and not being afraid of it and be like, oh, okay, I just have this feeling that I need to use this. And I always have, go with that. There's a reason why it's coming to you. Trust me, if trauma can be passed down, you also want mental health. If trauma can be passed down, so can knowledge, so yes. can healing. So yes. tap into all of that part of yourself that's just finding up, use it. <laughs> what do you have to lose, right? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, yeah, this is a this is a rich, beautiful conversation. I am like so grateful, Journey, for the words you're saying and Sadea for launching this conversation because it's just so rich and important to center, uh, you know, in in and in, in this world, in this moment, right? There's so much um, that allows us to feel untethered and kind of float through this world without feeling meaning or identity or or grounding and in, in, in ways and. You're really, you're really naming a specific way you you connect with your, you know, your your heritage and and, and your people and ground, right? And this is mm -hmm. this is really the space we just want to cultivate, just to remember that we are out here, you know, as Black, Indigenous, people of color, we are out here connecting with the land in in really uh, in really unique ways, but also uh, we are thriving, right? And um, I think it's important to just remind people that this is not just for some. This is for all, and mm -hmm. you know everyone can engage in it with plants or can engage with each other, you know, in a meaningful, intentional way that provides healing and access to, to abundance. Um, I want to just be conscious of time a little bit, and because we could we could gab all day. I know the three of us. You know me. Um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> but I just wanted to like offer you know uh, continued space for Sadea to just like. Do you have any like lasting words or things you wanted to kind of round out the conversation before we we sign off together? Yeah, you know, I, you know, there are so, I think what's really interesting about life everlasting and also about so many plants is the um, really just like the versatile nature of the plant, right? Like I'm, I'm looking in the book now at the chapter on life everlasting and we use it for so many things, cramps, a decongestant, um, foot pain, toothaches, uh, swollen glands associated with mumps is another indigenous use. Um, smoking it, chewing it for quinsy, bruises, fever, colds, like all of these things um, along with different parts of the plant being more potent for illnesses than others, right? Um, I think the thing that's really sitting with me is these plants do so much for us um, and how critical it is that we invest in the landscapes that they need to continue thriving um, as they continue to, to provide uh, nutrients or comfort or pleasure to us. You know, plants, they, they operate in so many different functions in our world as clothing, um, as a psychotropic, as something delicious, you know, they bring us so much um, nourishment. Um, and, and really, they're not asking for a whole lot, other than I would like to continue to exist. Um, I provide so much for everyone around me. Can we at least be considerate of the way that we're engaging with the, the space that they need to thrive? Um, and so right now, that's like, yeah, it's a little heavy on my heart as I think about, um, you know, the machinations of war turning again. Um, how are we treating the earth that we require so much from? That is such a great question to leave us all with, um, but also to like remind remind each other, right? We are not alone in answering these questions or navigating these paths, right? Because this that is a big <laughs> that is a big kind of way to leave. This, this space and I I I think that is just like a lifelong question we're all wrestling with and um 
to just say, you know, at the Foodway, you're always welcome. That is a safe place for you to come out and engage with these plants. Um, Journey and myself and Sadeo will be present um, here in the city, activating spaces, but um, definitely at the Bronx River Foodway at Concrete Plant Park. Um, so we welcome you to come out and continue connecting with us each Thursday at this time. Um, and Please. one other thing, would love, 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 um, especially since we are Bronx partners, um, if you are looking for cool ways to utilize plants in ways that are nourishing for you, but specifically um, centered in black and brown food ways, we also want to invite you out to the Bronx Farm to Table series that happens every month on Mondays, um, hosted by Dream Yards Community Organizing Department. Um, we actually have one coming up this Monday with Chef and farmer Maya Marie. Um, we've been talking about sorghum for two months and you don't want to miss this. Um, you can register at dreamyard.com slash COSI. And yeah, definitely, you know, go to the Foodway, come to Dream Yard's community programs and um, would love to just keep talking okay. with more folks about okay, that. Yeah. Definitely. And Journey, any last words closing out? There's so much. Yes. Um, well, you know, as always, thank you guys for coming and, you know, supporting us and just being part of these conversation. Um, I do want to say that I have some foraging and herbalism classes in person and online that are coming up. Um, you're going to be foraging. Um, making medicine, herbal medicine. So you can sign up for that. You can go to each one carry one.org. I don't know if I put it in this chat, you guys can see it, but yeah. You go to each one carry one.org and select nature classroom and you'll have all of the different classes that are taking place this spring. So I look forward to actually seeing you guys again next week, Thursday. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, folks. And um, I just want to acknowledge Journey. I will add it to the chat. I've been adding links through our Facebook okay. page so community <laughs> members can, can stay in the loop with what, what we're talking about in these chats. So um, you can refer here and also check out this recording later um, to, to recap anything you might have missed. Um, it will be uploaded to our YouTube page, at, which is youtube.com slash Bronx River. Um, and you can actually check out past talks that we've had um and they're all just housed there so i think without further ado we'll say goodbye to everyone in the audience thank you so much for participating and being with us um and we'll check you next thursday we'll be highlighting uh, a co-worker and friend of mine elaine feliciano um part of our conservation crew here at the bronx river alliance and her relationship with hope weed mm. so we're very excited to have that cool conversation yes Awesome. Thank you so much today for coming. It was awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate y'all. Bye. Bye, world. Bye. <laughs>